Okay. And just to set the context for our discussion today, mm -hmm. uh, I discovered as I was putting together the video slides on the Sun Pluto conjunction at 29 degrees Capricorn 59 minutes that the constellation informing the event is the Eagle constellation, mm -hmm. Aquila. And of course, there's many myths associated with that constellation. The one that caught my eye particularly was around Zeus, because of course we had done those sacred masculine classes on the Mars uh, Aries synodic cycle, which was the Aquarian archetype of the fierce protector. And we were using, um, at the time, Daniel Jamario's template for that cycle, which is the hero's journey. And uh, the, the, the stage where uh, the, the hero is going through the different labors that Daniel associated with Hercules uh, 12 labors and of course Hercules is the son of Zeus and yes. so in this myth that they're speaking to and just just to show it here this is the lost zodiac sign um, what she's speaking to specifically in here hold on let me just mute that um, is she's referencing when Zeus sees the fair youth Ganymede and uh, decides, you know, once again, he's going to turn himself into the great eagle and go down and snatch Ganymede and how he takes him back to Mount Olympus to become for the boy, the boy Ganymede to become the cup bearer of the gods and that as he filled their cups with nectar, they were enchanted by his beauty. And we had discovered in our sacred masculine classes that this idea of uh, SRA, satanic ritual abuse, particularly with children, particularly uh, with young boys had been revealed in the eighth labor, the mayor of Diomedes, the mayors of Diomedes, when Hercules is taking his very young friend and lover, uh, the son of Hermes, with him on this labor. And we got into this whole discussion. You had um, seen some article on Ganymede, uh, the name of one of the moons of Jupiter that had sent you on a whole uh discovery relating Ganymede to uh, SRA. And it so happens that that you know here we're talking about this again with this Pluto Sun conjunction. Uh, the uh, the Achille Eagles constellation referencing, Zeus and Ganymede and this nectar that the young boy offered to the gods could be yeah. even synonymous with adrenochrome. Um, and so we wanted to dive back into that to remind ourselves what we had discovered and what we had discussed uh, back then. And, and so I haven't had a lot of time to, to, to do that because of course yesterday I was down in Venice all day, but I did discover that it was the eighth labor, the mayors of, um, of Diomedes. And I did uh, go back and start listening to the video journal that we created at that eighth labor. And we started talking about it when we were doing the closure piece on the seventh labor. And I've got a timestamp here, but I said to you specifically, I sent you a text on the eight labor and that it smacks of what we are coming to know as SRA. 
And then I said to you, which made me think, huh, do we need to go back and look at the previous labors to see if they are also re uh, revealing to us oh, yeah. information related to this topic? And so we had quite an interesting discussion. Um, I invite you to go back and look at, okay. look at that. I'm thinking I'm even going to take it if I if I can. I don't really have the technical expertise. If I can try to take that clip out and use it. But I wanted to get really clear on the Ganymede piece. Yes. That we had discussed that you had then dived into. And I haven't listened to the next journal where we're going to do the closure piece around this eighth labor. And I'm going to, to see if there's more in there that we discovered and revealed and discussed that has just, you know, it's, this happened in July of 2021. Good, yeah. good, good. So now we're going to talk about, uh, you know, the seventh labor, this closure piece of the seventh labor that had to do with the Cretan bull. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I sent you a text about this eighth labor and um, that we're gonna talk about in a minute. And I said to you that from my perspective, listening to the story of the eighth labor, that it really, smacks of uh, what we're coming to know as SRA, Satanic Ritual Abuse. <clears throat> and then as I was looking back at this seventh labor and I'm thinking, well, so I started thinking, does that mean that all of these labors have in some way been revealing SRA, which was like, talk about a paradigm shift that your mind is not ready to accept. Well, yes. <laughs> you know, when I looked at this seventh labor to see if there were any elements that might be pointing to that, this whole thing about King Minos's wife and the Cretan bull uh, having this child known as the Minotaur, which is half bull, half woman. I mean, excuse me, half bull, half half human was what jumped out at me because we are hearing that this type of, I don't know if you wanna call it experimentation uh, has been happening in the deep underground military bases where they are genetically creating these beings that are half animals, half human. They're also doing it with aliens and humans, but we're hearing that they've been doing it with animals and humans as well. Yeah. And so, you know, this piece of this seventh labor just kind of from this new uh, lens of are there other signs of SRA showing up in these stories around the labors uh, her, uh, of Hercules, you know, this jumped out mm -hmm. at me. Mm -hmm. And that's where I stopped. I, that was like as much as I could take. Yeah, I exactly. Back, I haven't gone back and looked at the first six, uh, quite frankly. Uh, no, no, <laughs> no, it's hard. It's very hard. But I thought it was more uh, obvious with this with this labor, and I was also reminded um, that in in the debauchery of the Roman Empire when it was falling, uh, and it it had no moral stability at all. Um, when people would come to the Colosseum to witness the entertainment 
and I say that word very loosely, right? Because uh, it's there was there were an element of that there, um, without getting too graphic. Uh, it was a part of it, you know. It, it was something that they watched. So uh, I think you're right. There is something to these to this um, to these labors that um, tick a box, so to speak, in our in our consciousness. Um, that's really hard to look at. So right, right, right. And if you consider the fact that we are in this step of the hero's journey of tests allies and enemies mm -hmm. then clearly sra is a test and those that conduct sra are enemies and so it's interesting that mm -hmm. just as we're getting ready to complete this particular step mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the hero's journey that it's all of a sudden it's like it's like somebody turned on a light bulb when i listened to yes. this eighth labor yes I look at i agree and i think there is something um healing in there too that that um i'm i'm thinking about when he cleared out the barns of all the animals manure that it you know yes it was the water that washed that away all and that trends. excrement away yeah yes so and we're know. seeing that on the global yes. stage yes we are with and the dumps that, being washed mm -hmm. flooded yeah. and washed clean so there there's a point that you can see healing here too which may not have always been clear because i wasn't thinking of it that way um, even though some of the, um, you know, the, the uh, labors kind of gave you, you, you know, <laughs> right, right. Uh, the myth, right. Uh, uh, and, and myth always has something to share about truth. It yes. just always does. So I think it, it has to have some healing in there. Right. It has to have. Um, an ability to uh, make us aware of the healing. And in order to be aware of healing, we have to be aware of what's happening. I mean, I, 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 the word sin came into my head, which I don't normally use, but evil maybe is a better word, mm -hmm. uh, evil. So there's a way to heal. Right. And, um, if Hercules is the hero here, which he is, um, then he's he's got a mission to heal as well as whatever the king sent him to. Well, and, and so you're absolutely right. And I might perhaps even take that a step further mm -hmm. that he has a mission to reveal mm -hmm. so that he can heal. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yes. I, I, I like that. Yeah. Thank you. And, and through these labors, of course, you know, we're expected to confront, to have the courage to confront the insurmountable challenge, right? Yes. And uh, <laughs> this for thousands of years has been the insurmountable challenge for humanity to have the courage mm -hmm. to confront. Mm -hmm. And even now, as more and more of it's coming into the collective awareness, mm -hmm. uh, many people are being challenged in by being confronted with it. That's for sure. And it's, it's, it's a bit of shock sometimes, I think, to the system. And, 
and it's like cold water. Um, you just stick your toe in and you don't want to jump all at once and you probably better not because it's very shocking to do that. Mm. So just take it one step at a time and, uh, and begin to immerse yourself mm -hmm. uh, in not just what's, what the evil is, but, the, but how it can be changed and healed. Exactly. Exactly. So from this new lens of looking mm -hmm. at the seventh labor, which is, you know, such, a, as I said, a paradigm shift from what we even discussed in your personal session around this. Yes. What, what is coming up for you to bring closure to regarding this seventh labor? And, and, you know, remember that this labor activation happened in Leo, just as this next labor here in August is happening in Leo. This is all about, you know, the heart chakra, um, the compassionate heart. Leo is the sign of the compassionate heart. Um, so having said that, you know, what, what is coming up for you? Well, I have several planets in, in Leo and, and, I, and I look at it from that perspective and Pluto is there. Pluto is, is um, in Leo for me. Right. So I see this and it has actually been true as a transition, um, as a transformation, I should say. And, and you, you see it too. You started seeing the same things that, that uh, um, you know, the way that, that he's revealing. Mm -hmm. um, I see Pluto doing that. Um, my moon is there also. Um, Saturn is there and my mid heaven. So um, this is a, this is a pretty uh, powerful energy for me. And, um, and I'm seeing the revelations uh, that are to be transformed. And as, as it's happening with me, I'm becoming more involved at the collective level. And, um, and so rather than personally, which of course it will affect me also, but um, I'm, I'm beginning to understand at a collective level, um, the power of those, of, of those energies, the Leo energies and how I perceive that collectively. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'd say, I'd say that's the big, the big thing that happened around this particular labor. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, think about the work that you did for the children. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Birthed through your Saturn, Pluto, Moon conjunction and Leo. Now mm -hmm. about the animal welfare. And isn't it interesting that here we're talking about the animals and the mistreatment of them in terms of this kind of genetic manipulation. Yes. And, and he, he's, 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 there's been a mistreatment of animals in other labors as well um, that, that were kind of difficult, you know, to uh, the eels and um, uh, was it eels? Or birds, the birds, birds. the Not alien the birds. Yeah, he, he had to, to slay them because of what they represented. Look on that base, there's a, look on that base, there's a bird sitting on the back of that bull. That's interesting. That's right. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Is yeah. Right. So, um. I think that was, that's one of them. That's one of the revelations that he, 
his labors point out. That's yeah. Interesting. There's that bird. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so when we look at the shadow side of Leo, you know, yes. that's what they call yes. it, characteristics. Uh, what I'm seeing here that's coming up is this cruelty and this tendency to be autocratic. Uh, you know, for those that, that aren't familiar with what autocratic means, it's, you know, it's, it's someone who has absolute power, right? Generally in terms of like a ruler that has absolute power. Yeah. Um, but, um, but it's someone who has absolute power over another. And, you know, when we're talking about having to genetically create a half animal, half human being, that can only happen uh, when this shadow side of cruelty and autocratic nature is allowed to raise its ugly head, in my opinion. I agree. I'm just, I'm just thinking back uh, some of the other labors. I've got to go back and look at all of that because this, this really shows a whole new element um, about what, what was going full of synchronicities. For one thing, I have my son when I was born. My son is with Deneb, which is in the tail feather of Aquila. So um, that was informing me. And also um, a probe, a NASA probe called Juno, which is Hera yes. in the Greek. Yes. Past Ganymede and sent back pictures to NASA. And they were putting it out on a channel I follow, space something. And I, I still get those updates from NASA and that channel. But Juno uh, was so interesting now that I look back on it because the cupbearer prior to uh, this young man, what's his name again? Uh, Danny Mead. Yeah, and the and the young man that that uh, became. Oh shoot, what's his name? I've got it down here. His lover, uh, Abdullah. Oh, yes, yes, that okay. was Hercules' lover, who was not Ganymede. It was another young boy. This this boy. Yeah, no, Ganymede was was kidnapped. Abdullah was accompanying Hercules. Yes. Yes. And was his lover. Yes. Well, when when uh when this uh probe Juno passed Ganymede, uh I just clicked on it and I thought, wonder what what's is there a myth? Because I was always I always look up the myth behind the names and I looked up the myth and Ganymede was indeed, you know, kidnapped and abused or became the cupbearer. Um, now the cupbearer prior to uh, uh, to Ganymede was Hebe or Hebe. Hebe was a daughter of Zeus and Hera. She was the cupbearer prior to Ganymede. And Ganymede became the cupbearer because Hebe married Hercules. So it's all intertwined in here in a way that informs us that it is truly uh, telling us that, that this myth is uh, revealing the product that is adrenochrome and where right. it comes from. Right. So um, that's why I looked up Ganymede. And as soon as I found that legend, I looked at all of the advertising that has been used uh, with the Ganymede uh, uh, symbol, which is, you know, the youth uh, being kidnapped. Um, and one of them was Anheuser-Busch, 
<laughs> I mean, these companies, it, I think they really knew what they were doing, you know, but I didn't at the time. So, well, and I um, think that this goes back to what we've discussed numerous times and that you even spoke to recently about mm -hmm. how they have to, they are required by cosmic law yes. to, to inform humanity as to what it is that they're doing. And unfortunately, because of the veils that the dark matrix has created, it's so in your face and still so much of humanity doesn't get it. And let me give you a recent example. I was just discussing with Helen and Gina yesterday, as you mentioned, this Anheuser-Busch uh, uh, marketing that was referencing the images related to, to, to Ganymede and uh, children and SRA. I just saw this new FedEx commercial about the fantastical tales of FedEx delivery. And uh, the guy has to get something to this beachside wedding. And so he gets it there and, and, and it's in a flash. I'm like, it was in a flash and I saw it. And I was like, no, there's no way that's what that said. I went back and I paused it. And what happens is after the FedEx and it's all uh, kind of cartoonish, you know, Mm -hmm. After the FedEx guy delivers whatever he has to deliver to the beachside wedding, this to-do list, like, like his personal to-do list flashes on the screen. Number one, deliver baby. Wow. Number two, fight off an alligator. Number three, save the wedding. And I'm thinking to myself, no way that it's that blatant. Number one, deliver baby. Is this global network using FedEx? And remember, remember the movie with Tom Hanks where he ends up on the deserted island with the, with the ball that's named Wilson and he kind of goes a little deranged out there. What was the airline that crashed? That caused him to end up on that deserted island. It was a FedEx airplane. That's what he did. That was his job, wasn't it? Yes. And so here on this to-do list, deliver baby. And, I'm, and, and I said to Gina and Helen, I'm like, look, if you and I were to help a doctor or a midwife deliver a baby, we wouldn't say, we delivered baby, we would say we helped to deliver the baby. Yeah. Delivering a baby, delivering the babies is very different and it's highly subtle than deliver baby, meaning I'm shipping and delivering babies. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? I'm that telling you, I just saw it like two, two or three nights ago. Wow. I about fell wow. off the couch. And it and, and, flashes so quickly on the screen that. Yes. Yes. That it's you can miss it. Almost. Yes. It's almost subliminal. Exactly. And you know, the, the aunt getting to, like Anheuser Bush um what their symbol is it's an eagle it's it and the Clydesdales you know the Clydesdales the mares of the of Diomedes yes because yes. they're these giant fire breathing human flesh eating mares and of course right. who does humanity associate is with one of the most giant breeds of horses Clydesdales Clydesdales and uh and it's it's just it's everywhere and I think that we we could probably we're probably going to be astounded with how much comes uh up in the next 
20 years, say, you know, I may not be here for 20 years, but you will and you'll see it. And uh, um, it, it's, it's, I think more people are becoming aware of adrenochrome. Uh, it, it's more and more amazing to me. I, I was watching a uh, British mystery show called Lewis, um, who is in Oxford. And I, I saw that in the very first episode. It's yes. like right out there. It's yes, he said. Adrenochrome. He said adrenochrome, and I just about fell off my chair because yep. uh, I, when I first watched it, it never occurred to me. But I was rewatching, rewatching the series, and yeah. I'll be damned, I'll be damned. I couldn't believe it. There it is, right yeah. there, and that was made quite a while ago. Yes, Lewis. it was. And, um, yeah. In fact, uh, I had looked up at the time. And I texted somebody about it. I thought maybe it was you, maybe it was Karen. I had texted somebody about, because I looked up when did, was it? And I think it was like back in 2007 or something when mm -hmm. that first episode came out. I'm like, oh my God, this far back, they were revealing this information. Yes. And of course, mm -hmm. nobody took it seriously. To them, it's all, right? It's, it's a television program. It's all make-believe. Exactly. Went um, in one ear and out the other. Out Who the other. Register. It's just some kind of street drug, you know, that. Uh, or even a make believe drug. Right. A make believe drug would be. I, I know it didn't even it didn't even register with me until I saw it again. Yeah. And um, I, it was just it was <laughs> incredible. Uh, um, I can't believe it. No. Well, and so just again, for the for purposes of context here, I want to reiterate what I shared with you earlier about yeah. this Pluto Sun conjunction. They mm -hmm. they became conjunct yesterday, January mm -hmm. 20th at 29 degrees, 59 minutes Capricorn. Yes. That's like the PhD mastery point because the next minute takes you to the zero degree Aquarius threshold. Aquarius. Yeah. And so they continued to move together through the course of the day to where they together were then also standing at the zero degrees of Aquarius. And then later in the day, the sun carried on into about the 20 minutes of of Aquarius mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. Pluto was still at zero, zero Aquarius. And there's a lot of information out there about the Pluto sun conjunction at, at zero degrees of Aquarius. I haven't right. seen anything that acknowledges that that conjunction starts at 2959 Capricorn. And of course we know in astrology, we have this tendency to round up. So according to the rounding rules, we would actually round 29 degrees Capricorn, 59 minutes up to zero. But you cannot gloss over that that's where the conjunction started and without rounding it up, that they continued to travel together to cross that threshold to the zero, zero point of Aquarius which means we've got the Capricorn energies and frequencies embedded. We've got the Aquarian frequencies embedded, both, both. And isn't it fascinating that Aquila and its constellation referencing this Zeus Ganymede part of the myth because Zeus would turn himself into an eagle to snatch children or to snatch young maids to impregnate mm -hmm. uh, is a part of this because Benjamin Fulford on January 15th, which is just this past Monday, which is within this frame of when the Aquila constellation is informing us that, let me just tell you real quickly what that time frame is. It starts on January 14th. It goes through January 28th. 
the very next day, January 15th, is when Benjamin Fulford put out his new weekly report that speaks to the revelation of the horrific tunnels underneath the, that major synagogue in New York City and the discovery that all of these synagogues in New York are connected to these tunnels where this kind of satanic ritual abuse was going on to get the adrenochrome. That's what the purpose of this satanic ritual abuse is, is to create the adrenochrome. That's right. And, and what happens is the adrenochrome goes into the flesh of the child. The child then gets sacrificed, right? And then they have to use the mitzvah to clean and purify themselves before they can actually eat the flesh of yeah. the sacrificed child. Yeah. And how the entrance way to these tunnels is through the children's museum. All of this being revealed under the influence of this constellation, Aquila, the eagle, that ties back to this Zeus slash Ganymede myth. Mm -hmm. And being a part of this major paradigm shift of energy around Pluto and Sun traveling together from mm -hmm. 2959 Capricorn to 00 Aquarius. And now think mm -hmm. about this part. This is how potent and how significant what happened yesterday is. Pluto's going to stay in Aquarius until about sometime in September. I don't remember the exact date. Then it's going to go back into Capricorn for a couple of months. And I think mid-November, it goes back into Aquarius. And then mm -hmm. it won't go into Capricorn for another 250 years. Right. But when Pluto makes that ingress from Aquarius to Capricorn and then back again during those two months, the sun's not going to be standing with it. The sun's moving forward. So the fact that the two of them, mm -hmm. right, the, the sun that is, is the fuel, the creative life force for everything in our solar system, much less our planet, nothing can, can live, thrive, grow without this, the, that creative life force energy coming from the sun yeah. combined with the regenerative power of Pluto moving together and these revelations coming forward. We, we had mm -hmm. a discussion in mm -hmm. that video journal that I referenced that we did in July of 21 around the eighth labor of, of uh, the Mars synodic cycle. And we were doing the closure piece and you were talking about the big takeaway is you, you weren't feeling closure. You were feeling revelation. All this revelation. Mm -hmm. And that the closure would come later. Pluto. Pluto and the sun revealing all of this stuff in a potent, powerful, transformational way. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, um, and it goes backwards. I mean, it, it, we can now see lots of things that have happened that um, that that require uh, us to be attentive to this particular problem, and um, and yet we weren't awake enough to know that that was happening, and they're counting on that. And um, you know, when when this happened yesterday. I am, I was so invigorated. It was just a whole new feeling of uh, enlivenment. It was, it was very strong and I don't normally feel things that deeply. Uh, I, I feel the energy, but not, this was a very, very invigorating connection for me, the sun and Pluto. And so, um, I don't I don't know how to explain it other than I, I just really uh, don't. wonderful wonderful yeah. and the other thing I want to speak to just you know because it's relevant mm -hmm. we, we keep talking about Ganymede 
Mm -hmm. Well, then, and how, how he was, you know, taken to Mount Olympus by Zeus in his eagle form, how he became the cup bearer of the nectar. But the next part of the myth is then Zeus turns Ganymede into the constellation Aquarius, which is known as the water bearer. The water bearer. Yeah, that's on that that constellation. I put it on my matrix. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so this ties back to the significance about how the Sun Pluto conjunction began at 2959 Capricorn and they moved together into yeah. zero zero Aquarius because that shows us two things that are coming to me right now. Maybe more will come as we're discussing this. One, it's talking about, it's talking about how the authority figures, right? 2959, that's the mastery, authority, autocratic power has abused its power. And so the sun and Pluto have completely rebirthed, right? What does Pluto do? It rises from the ashes. The sun fuels that resurrection, that rebirth, that regenerous, mm -hmm. regenesis. It completely rebirthed the power of the leaders of our family, homes, and communities to be aligned with right action, hmm. dharma. And then it goes into zero, zero Aquarius, bringing in the Ganymede frequencies of all the children that have been satanically uh, abused, for the production of adrenochrome and then ritually sacrifice okay. for the consumption of the adrenochrome that are themselves going to be this this theme around this is going to be like its own kind of way shower into how we as a collective consciousness can transmute the frequencies of that abuse of power from the Capricorn Cancer lineage, mm -hmm. right? Capricorn mm -hmm. Cancer. How are we evolving family, home, community for the next seven generations? These frequencies of Aquarius with the Pluto sun energies are going to transmute that so that it's transmuting it for the next seven generations through the quantum field. It's going to be beyond the next seven generations because it's being transmuted in the quantum field, which the Aquarian energies represent. It's going to be transmuted within the collective consciousness of humanity, which the Aquarian energies represent. Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Do you, do you recognize too, I'm sure you do, that the new buzzword in the spiritual community, community is quantum? Yeah. It was sovereignty, right? Yeah. When Pluto was going through Capricorn and now mm -hmm. it's quantum as Pluto quantum. has been dipping into Aquarius and will be, yeah. yes. Yes. Yeah. And so Thank you for speaking to that because we must be very discerning mm -hmm. about these buzzwords because yes. these buzzwords can be used to be deceiving. Yes, absolutely. To twist the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people, spiritual people in the global spiritual community that are knowingly or unknowingly mm -hmm. being utilized to create that uh, 
that incoherence in the field, that chaos. They want to, they want to the muddy field. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they're being used. Uh, I'm sure some of them don't realize that. <clears throat> Others may. Right. That's but, why I um, say knowingly or unknowingly. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so so uh, I'll bet you anything that the word that uh, Webster finds to be the word of the year uh, is quantum. Like last year, it was authentic. Um, people hear these words <clears throat> and a lot of them, they want to look it up. They want the, the you know, the base of the word where does this word come from what does it really mean and that's a good thing that people do that yeah um i don't know anything about the people that created the dictionary um but but i i i use it anyway you know mm -hmm. i i just don't i don't go there we have to have some resource mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um and, and there's lots of dictionaries. There's some of them that are like this thick. They're huge. Right. And right. Um, they're only in libraries because nobody could possibly lift them and look at them and all that. But um, anyway, uh, I think they, they do track this kind of thing. It's interesting to me um, to, to see where they go with it. Well... And what I'm receiving is that they're using it as an energetic weapon. Yeah, I agree. Because people yeah. don't seem to recognize that every word has a frequency, but yes. it's not a frequency. It is mm -hmm. a spectrum of frequencies that is like, uh, that gets distilled into a dominant frequency. And so um, they can tap in anywhere in the spectrum to try to manipulate people. And this is why when people hear phrases, they have different understandings of the phrase. For instance, somebody will say, I'm broke, meaning I have no money, right? That, that's, right. A, that's, a, that's a slang expression. Right. But that, you know, what I'm broke means to me. Yeah. And what I'm broke means to you and what I'm broke means to another are completely different in terms of how we're using the frequency of that expression. For one person, I'm broke may be they're homeless. They're on the streets. For another person, I'm broke may mean, well, my savings account is now down to $100,000, you know? Yeah. Right, exactly. This is a huge disparity, and I use that as as an as an example because this is what happens with words and how words are used to in language to do the spell casting. And so, when you look up a word like authentic or sovereignty or quantum, it's not the end all be all. It's a starting place. It is a portal for you mm -hmm. to tap into the frequencies that that word carries to discern at a very subtle level what the refined energies around that word are inviting you to expand into so that you don't get trapped, right? right. You don't get your foot trapped into these lower frequencies that are being used to manipulate the consciousness of the United States or the consciousness of Europe or the consciousness of humanity at the global level. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And Pluto having this revelatory nature that we discussed in that, in that video journal around this eighth labor where it just fit me in the face that these labors are speaking to the satanic ritual abuse that has been going on for thousands of mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it it's just the stepping off point, the stepping off point. This is when Yeshua revealed to us when we got to that point in this 
in the uh, Mars synodic cycle where he was getting ready to go into the underworld that mm -hmm. Yeshua's was like, now nah, cannot use this template anymore. It's no more, it's no longer resonant. It's no longer relevant. You cannot use this template because as I always say, <laughs> Yeah, you're not going to get <laughs> clean taking a bath in a dirty tub, right? right. You're not right. going to, so you have to clean it, or you have to walk away from it. And this is what, of course, we were guided to do by Yeshua in that sacred, uh, in those sacred masculine classes uh, related to using the hero's journey and specifically the labors of Hercules. Uh, as a template for all of that but boy wasn't it revelatory and I think that that is a piece of Pluto that people miss they get that Pluto will burn things to the ground they get yeah. that the phoenix will <laughs> rise from the ashes they get that there's this death and rebirth cycle this regenerative but I don't think that they've realized the revelatory nature of Pluto as that alchemical process is happening. And yeah. we picked up on that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, what, what did you think while I'm, while we're, we're talking about that, um, uh, of, of the, um, let me get it, make sure that I got it right. it here oh yeah that um <clears throat> yesterday i sent you a text and uh, i i i thought about um pluto ruling putre, uh, putrefaction uh pluto uh, pluto oversaw that part of uh, that step of fermentation. Did you think that was, that held water? Well, <clears throat> so let's speak a little bit about, about what the frequencies of putrefaction are affecting. Let's speak to that first. Do you remember what you shared with us in the, in the Venus gate? Mm -hmm. So just kind of give, give me a synopsis of that. Uh, putrefaction it's a melting down of most of our our belief system it's um it's the complete liquefaction of of our um process of becoming new uh you have to go through it you have to in order to transform into the butterfly the the uh, caterpillar loses like 85 90% of its body it just melts away. And then fermentation, it begins to reform in a new thing. And so those are the two steps. And Pluto actually does uh, represent the, you know, the fermentation. But I saw, um, uh, let's see, it was Pluto was in charge of the liquefaction, the putrefaction, and um, was it Aquarius? What was I, it that was? Yeah, was so it, that's what you mentioned. You mentioned Aquarius. Yeah, and Aquarius um, oversaw the fermentation. I picked so, an air sign for that. Right. Uh, um, let's see, there's a sign and then there's a planet, but... right. So I'm trying to find all the different planets and signs that can be associated with the different steps. Right. Um, I'm doing a, a full scale uh, paper on it where you where you have the crystals, planets, the colors, the um, all the different references that that go with each step. This is the only step that has two steps within it. Right, right, exactly. So, like the totem, 
I want a totem for each and, mm -hmm. and people, other people have done this work also. Mm -hmm. But um, the totem like for putrefaction is the vulture. The vulture is the uh, carrion, you know, um, what? This is so crazy because yeah. in that clip from that video journal around the mm -hmm. eighth labor, when we were doing the closure piece on the mm -hmm. seventh labor, you brought up the previous labor related to the Stymphalian birds. Yes. And how exactly. they, they were a problem yeah. because they were eating the humans. Right. And we were talking about how even on the image of the bull that Hercules was supposed to bring back, mm -hmm. that was the gift uh, to King Mino, uh, My Minos from Neptune how that piece of pottery had a bird on the bull's back. And I said, well, and if you look to the bird family, the bird that comes forward is the vulture because okay. it's the one that eats the carrion. It's the one, it's the bird. It's, and you it's know that it's, it's interesting because alchemy is all based on nature. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, they watch nature and how things function and then they try to reproduce it. That's yeah. where gold came from. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why they tried to change into gold. They, they looked at the science of the earth. How does she produce gold? Mm -hmm. And then they would try to, you know, identify that through chemicals and other metals. And so I'm beginning to see that some people accomplish that. Yeah. They did actually figure that out. Yeah. Mary, uh, Maria, Mary Papatissa was mm -hmm. one of them. There were three women that were said to have been able to reproduce that right. step. Right. And and I thought, you know, when I started, eh, you know, that's just a that's just a false uh thing, a false uh association with with alchemy, but it isn't. It really isn't. That's right. science and alchemy were joined with spirit. There was yeah. no separation at that point. Exactly. The church is what and Rome is what yes. did it. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, yes. It, it's real interesting, uh, you know, to to come to the conclusion that within nature, all, all these things are produced. All the crystals, all the metals, all the wealth of the world is produced in nature. And that was, they were trying to figure that out. You know, how, how does she do that? <laughs> right, right, right. Well, and what's fascinating about you discussing that is Gina and I, Hal and I were having a discussion yesterday where Gina was speaking to these lab created diamonds and these lab yes. created rubies. And exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and I said mm -hmm. to Gina, I said, and, and, and Gina said something along, you know, and, and people think that they're the same or they, you know, they market them as being the same. And I said, well, you know, that they're not the same, right? Think about how long it takes the earth to create coal from which a diamond is made. Right. During that entire process, however long it takes, is it millions of years? The frequencies of the earth are being embedded in that ultimate diamond. Yes. The lab yes. created diamonds do not have and those frequencies. No, and it's no. the same for anything else, excuse me, <clears throat> that the earth creates within her body. Mm -hmm. They're infused. And, and not only with her frequencies, but frequencies from the entire cosmos. Because we know how everything on this planet is informed by everything else in the cosmos because of this unified source field that we are all fractals of lab created diamond rubies or lab created whatever do not contain those frequencies and if they try to tell you that they're the same thing don't be no. fooled no exactly and that's how that, that's exactly how i look at it and um and as a bookseller, I have looked at a physical book and a 
electronic, a digital book. They are not the same. When you read them, you will not get the same insights. Uh, if you read the same book in physical, the same book in digital, they might mean two different things. That's because their lineage is different. And I'm not saying that a digital lineage is, is not as good. I don't like it as much, but, um, but it has its own lineage. And a book has its own lineage, which goes back thousands, millions of years to the very first communication on walls and in dirt, however it was done by early man. And um, so, so it's the same thing. It, it's the same thing. If you wanna get the earth, it, the, the lineage of the book, you read the physical. If you, if you are just interested in what the author shares, then you got the digital and that doesn't carry the same. It's the same thing exactly. It's got to go back to the to nature, and yes. um, and so it's so it's so fascinating to me to, yeah. to 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 study this and realize that everything has a frequency like that. Yeah, uh, and 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 um, it, it's not the same. Yeah, sometimes it's it it's okay, not bad. Uh, Reading a digital book isn't a bad thing. I do it too. You know, it's very convenient to download a book on your on your iPad or your reader and and not try to figure out where you're going to put a thousand books. You know, um, but but it doesn't carry the same weight. Yeah, literally and figuratively. <laughs> I, I I agree with you. I agree with you. And 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 again, this is such a synchronistic part of the conversation because the message. Mm -hmm that I received from Sophia today mm -hmm. is that we each have our own, our, our each of us have our own crystalline structure and mm -hmm. our own crystalline structure has its own tonal frequency that creates these musical spheres that identify who we are as a unique manifestation. Uh, uh, as a as a unique being and she aligned that uh in it uh, analogously with the dolphins the dolphins have unique signature whistles that the people the other dolphins in their pod when they hear that signature whistle it's like me saying well hi maureen are you saying hi i'm maureen it identifies you in a unique way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, and so when you're talking about the relevance of the lineage and the frequency of the lineage, this even goes back to our own design, divine self and our own crystalline structure that has its own identifying frequency through these musical spheres. Exactly. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. 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 And to bring it full circle to answer your question about Pluto and Aquarius relevant to uh, putrefaction and uh, fermentation, mm -hmm. I would say absolutely mm -hmm. uh, Pluto represents the putrefaction process because, you know, whenever you're burning something into ash, you are dissolving it into its mm -hmm. most fundamental building block in terms of its physical manifestation, mm -hmm. which is what happens yeah. with the caterpillar and the chrysalis. Yes. It gets completely dissolved. In that sense, it's liquid. It's not ash, but it, but. I see it as the same process that's taking it down to this fundamental building block from which can emerge the something new. It has to be created from a building block, right? And so in terms of uh, Aquarius representing that fermentation process where now it's taking this very fundamental building block 
Mm -hmm. and it's creating something new out of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. if Aquarius represents the quantum field in the way that I understand it, we've talked about how the moment that you put your awareness on a wave in the quantum, now it becomes a dot, a point that can manifest. And it's yeah. going to manifest based on your awareness that you are embedding in that intentional focus. Mm -hmm. Why is it when a caterpillar gets liquefied in the chrysalis, it becomes a butterfly. Why is it that it doesn't become a dragonfly? Or why is it that it doesn't become a ladybug? Because the it, it is a co-creative process that has the intentional frequency using that building block to create the butterfly. Exactly. And that's yeah. how we manifest from the quantum field the same way. Mm -hmm. So... And that's the fermentation process. So absolutely, I would say you're right on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. From my perspective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I wanted you to, to look at, you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject for sure. <clears throat> yeah. So... Think about them bringing it again full circle to the sun and Pluto moving together. Yeah. From 2959 Capricorn, right? The put, the putrefaction of, of those in power that call themselves the leaders, the elders, the way showers that have really been running amok. And now... Pluto and the sun cross together into zero, zero Aquarius for the fermentation so that all of the, the illuminated leaders, way showers, elders can come forth into the collective consciousness of humanity, into the global community that will be the result of Pluto's travels through Aquarius over the next couple of decades. Right. Right. I mean, okay. this is why for me, uh, it's highly significant that people are just talking about Pluto sun at zero degrees of Aquarius and they're leaving out a fundamental piece. This conjunction began at 2959 Capricorn and moved into zero, zero. Both sides of that are just like putrefaction and fermentation. Mm. Both of those are involved in that. What is it? The fifth step that we're at? In yes. yes. What step. a freaking synchronicity. I know it is at the fifth gate. Yes. I'm just, it just amazes me. <laughs> right yes mm -hmm. yep um it, it's uh it it all comes together in in ways that blow your mind you know it does it does because we haven't we weren't raised to believe in magic uh in the universe or anywhere else you know right it's a trick right um and of course it's how you perceive it, isn't it? Right. Mm -hmm. The right. magician makes like, someone they make someone disappear and it looks like they're gone, you know. Right, right, right. And of course, with this 3D uh realm of duality, now we've got the illuminated side of the magic and the shadow side of the magic, right? Mm -hmm. The illuminated yes. side being the magic of alchemy, the shadow side being the dark magic uh the black magic that the dark forces have used to con control manipulate yes. humanity yes and uh, i think more people are waking up uh maybe they can't go the full route you know it's too it's too traumatizing and it is 
extremely traumatizing. Uh, but their understanding, they're thinking, what, what's going on here? This isn't right. This can't be, you know. Um, and 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 the dark forces have caused humanity to turn on itself. It's like it's like you circle the wagons and point your guns in the middle and you shoot each other. That's exactly what's happening yep. uh, to the human psyche. And right. uh, so they're fighting each other and that's what, they don't want that to stop. Right, right. Because the more that they kill each other, the less work they have to do. Oh yeah, <laughs> they, the, and the more engaged we are with hating each other. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and nobody seems to, get on that point they right they don't, and they you don't know what it kind of reminds me of it kind of reminds me of mm -hmm. the goddess heiress right that for so long they were calling her the goddess of discord right, right. she threw the golden apple in and now all of these jealous women start this cat fight right right Exactly. That's what it is. That's yeah. their myth that's telling us exactly what they're doing. Because we know that Eris is not the goddess of discord. She's the goddess of radical truth. And they don't want you to know the radical truth. They don't. They do not. And um, it's interesting. They can find the subjects that will divide women and men. Women, of course, is, is reproductive rights. Um, they don't look at the problems behind it. They want to just go on the surface. They want to stop what's happening. But you can't. can't do that. You have to look at the, the reasons behind anything. And they don't do that. They won't do that. Right. And they, they um, you know, like, like abortion. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes that idea at all. And above all, the women who make that choice don't like it, but they don't have a choice within the culture. Um, I mean, they do have a choice, but but it's a very scary one, and and uh, and we're, we're, women are not supported uh, in that particular instance. They're not. They can't get childcare. They can't get maternity leave. You know, they they can't get any of these things that women need in order to have a baby. You know. And um, most of these women are single. So anyway, you throw that golden apple in the middle and we're all scrapping with each other. Right. And the power of women is watered down because of it. Right. You know? Right, right, right. And uh, I remember when that happened between Planned Parenthood and um, the the pink, pink one, uh, uh, the other group. Oh, what's it called? They had the pink ribbon, you know? And and they the other group uh, um, that advocates for women's rights uh, said that they couldn't support Planned Parenthood clinics anymore. I think it might have been because of the uh, selling of of the uh, parts, you know, for for research. Um, now everybody should have been able to get behind that. There wasn't anybody who would look at that situation and say, well, that's no good. We don't want that. This is a sacred thing and it's a horrible choice. And now you're treating it like a commodity. You're selling parts. And so one of the women's rights groups with the pink ribbon and Pan Parenthood clashed and they took their support away from each other. Now that was a very, very deep wound for women uh, because we supported both those situations. Both those organizations helped women pretty much in the same way, you know? Um, but but after we found out that that the uh, the children, the, the fetuses and all of that were being used for science without anybody's permission, there you go. That's that's a horror that should have united us, but it didn't. They figured right. out a way that it wouldn't. Right, because they had infiltrated yeah. both organizations. Right. And then they threw the golden apple in to get them 
scrapping amongst themselves. And so now the pure intention of what inspired the creation of those organizations has been cor completely corrupted completely. and perverted because of the infiltration. Absolutely. That's exactly what happened. And there's a million different ways they can do that in all subjects. Um, they, ha they have done that. And what's yeah. fascinating, because our work deals with these archetypes that go back to these myths, mm -hmm. is we, can, we discovered in that video journal on the eighth labor, how, oh my goodness, the myths of around the labors of Hercules are disclosure. And so we're seeing here, just like with the myth around the goddess Eris being the goddess of chaos, they have used these myths for thousands of years to meet that, you know, universal law of disclosure. Yeah. And people think they're just stories. Mm -hmm. They don't really mean anything. Exactly. The goddess of radical truth was not invited to the party. Right. And um, <laughs> <laughs> that was not something they wanted at the party. You know? Right. That's <laughs> um, right. It's, it's just so... So interesting to to become aware and and I just love your insights on things that you're just brilliant. Um, so so I I just hope you reach lots and lots of people. Well, know. thank you. I appreciate that. And my my hope and my intention is that this event that happened in the linear timeline, exact yesterday, January 20th, the people understand the potency of the seed of consciousness yeah. that was planted for humanity. An empowering seed, a revelatory seed Mm -hmm. of consciousness that was planted as Pluto and the sun moved together yesterday from 29 degrees, 59 minutes of Capricorn into that zero degrees, zero minutes of Aquarius, bringing all of those frequencies together, right? From the earth realm to the air realm, yeah, yeah. right? We manifest through our consciousness, how are we going to manifest in a new way right. at, at a higher frequency Yeah, from the seed of consciousness that was planted for us out of the grace of source by Pluto and the sun coming together and making that journey, crossing that bridge together. Exactly. This is going to be like nobody's business. They're not yeah. even going to be able to conceive of what this is going to eventually germinate and manifest as. Mm -hmm. But it's clear that the frequencies are having an impact at the global level, because as I said, the revelation mm -hmm. of what was going on below mm -hmm. those synagogues and the entrance being in that children's museum coinciding with the influence of the Aquila constellation. Yeah. That is a synchronicity that can only be created by the infinite intelligence of source. Yeah. Right. Yes. And Wonderful. so if people don't think that what's going on out there has anything to do with us, <laughs> once again, they're sorely mistaken. This goes back to the, to the scripture for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I think the Bible is probably coded with this stuff all through it. Um, I've I've purchased a program. 
it's hard for me to sit down and read the Bible. I mean, it's just so uh, the language, you know, the interpretation. And it's been interpreted many times. So, you know, whether we're getting the true message is probably not, it's not there. But nevertheless, it carries a frequency. And <clears throat> I purchased this program where you can start to study the Bible in 12 minutes a day. And I thought, well, I can do that. She broke it down. She's really good at that. She broke it down into 12 minutes and you check it off. Each day you check off what, what you've read that she's put there in about 352 days, you've, you've covered it. And I thought, well, I'm going to do that. So it wasn't expensive. So I did. And I got my little check mark, check sheet and what she recommends. You start the beginning, you know. Um, so I'm going to have to read all those baguettes, <laughs> you know, so-and-so beget and beget and beget. And it follows the line, you know, uh, of it, of, uh, DNA and uh, it's interesting but I'm going to do that because I think it's got a lot to reveal to us um, probably they all do the Torah and the, the Talmud all of them I'm sure they do have you know information that that was interpreted incorrectly and uh, it's going to be interesting it oh, is David. interesting. And as Pluto goes into these Aquarian energies, you know, speaking of looking at these holy scriptures <laughs> mm -hmm. and all of the translations over, you know, however many hundreds of years, thousands of years. Yes. What I'm being shown is, you know, you have to remember what I said in the beginning about each word having its own frequency, but it's a spectrum of frequencies that gets um trying to find the right word that gets that gets tuned to a dominant frequency is the best way I can think to say it so each of us as, as Sophia said to me we have our own tonal frequency our own musical sphere so as we engage with the frequencies of the lineage of the holy scriptures we're like a key that is unlocking a part of that spectrum of frequencies that that holy scripture has mm -hmm. now one person as a key may only be able to access this part of the spectrum but another person at this frequency can unlock this spectrum and so if you think that each individual person who's done a translation is accessing a different point frequency point within the entire frequency band of the holy scripture no wonder they're all different no wonder some of them seem to contradict the others. Right. Uh, and so are the frequencies that were translated down here wrong compared to the frequencies that were translated up here? In a dualistic uh, dimension, that's how it appears mm -hmm. by the nature of duality. But in a holistic they're not contradictory at all. Goes back to what we say about the five blind men and each of them holding a different part of the elephant. One's des describing the tail, the other's describing the leg. And they're like, no, nope, that's not what it looks like. Yeah. And so I think this is something that people need to be aware of because this is also used as fodder for creating the scrapping, right? And it's another golden apple that gets tossed in to create the scrapping amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Things are not right or wrong, black or white. That's duality. That's the polarity of the 3D. How can we bring our discernment out of polarity and into the wholeness of what's being offered? 
Yeah. And the fun, the juiciness is being able to look at it through this facet. And now let's look at it through that facet. And let's look at it through this facet so that we can get a more integrated understanding. But can we have a full understanding of something that's infinite and eternal? Yeah. There's always yeah. going to be deeper and deeper clarity. There's always more going to be. And more clarity. Yeah, always. There always and will be. Your personal frequency, musical sphere key is going to unlock whatever it is that you're ready to dive into. Yeah. Yeah. Have you thought about, you know how I've, I've Interesting, I, I follow, I mean, you send me like the Fullard. Um, the Fullford stuff. Fullford stuff. And there are others too um, that have a Patreon account as well as a way that you can read some of their information. But if you want to go deeper, you, you need to be a Patreon member. Is there any way that you could do that. I mean, I don't know, it's, it's probably putting you out there in a situation you may not feel like you wanna handle. But if you had a channel where you had, you know, just a, a basic outline of what it is you're working on. And if you're interested in more information, you can find it at my Patreon account. Almost everybody does that. And I was wondering if you felt the call to do anything like that yet? Well, <clears throat> I hear what you're saying. And to answer that directly and then go back to the Fulford thing, because I want to make some clarifying remarks around that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I feel like to a certain extent, I am doing what you're asking because I do have my YouTube channel, the Rose Real Mystery School. Right, yes. There are some video journals that I put out for everybody. Okay. Uh, and then there are some video journals that is exclusive contact, uh, content for the Patreon members. Yes. And I had been putting these little overviews out there, kind of saying, this is what this is about. And if you want to get, you know, the two hour okay. version instead of the five minute version, please subscribe to Patreon. It's yeah. a lot of work for me. Yeah. And, and it hasn't borne any fruit for okay. me. And I don't have a lot of subscribers on YouTube anyway. I have about 190. I mean, I've had this YouTube channel almost a decade, uh, definitely seven or eight years by now. And I only have 190 subscribers. Yeah. And out of those 190 subscribers, none of them have thought, oh, yeah, I want to hear more about that. Okay. And well come to Patreon. Sophia would tell you if you need to do something, she'll tell you, she'll guide you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so I, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm open to receiving guidance from her on how I can do the work she's asking me to do in a way that is requiring less and less uh, linear time. Okay. Of investment yeah. for me yeah it's getting it's getting overwhelming I know it's yeah. becoming very overwhelming and you know I I hate to put it in 3d terms by saying it like there's this point of diminishing returns it's like you know there's nothing coming back from all of the effort and energy and time I'm putting into it I hate right. to boil it down to to that and I am in a human body. I've got to right. be able to take care of my human body. Right. And so with all of the energy and effort I'm putting out, any downtime, it's not time to enjoy this class or that class or reading this book or reading that book. It's downtime for me to get regrounded, get recharged, get re-energized. And so... It's, it's gotten to the point where it feels out of balance for me. 
Okay. And I'm looking for a way for Sophia to inspire me mm -hmm. to get out what she wants me to get out that isn't so physically draining and uh, yes. time consuming. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I'm yeah. uh I think that yesterday the 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 whole planning that I did about the three prong uh way I'm gonna spend my time was was part of that because yeah. I can become um totally involved in my study and not take care of the other things I need to take care of. And so yeah, I get yeah, I get that. Yeah. I, I just I, I just need people to I mean, people have to wake up and however that happens. I mean, we're not in charge of that. That's that's not our uh, our domain at all. That falls under others. And and so I guess we're receiving what we need to be and what yeah. we need to do. And yeah. yeah. So let's bring it back to Fulford. Benjamin Fulford seems like a really nice guy. I know people have said all kinds of things about him and, and his reports, positive and negative. And I just want to say that I don't feel one way or the other. Yeah. Particularly with this solar plexus activation that we had this month. Karen and I were talking about this. Part of being able to stand in your personal power is tied back to how you are able to refine your ability to discern. And a lot of people give their power away by blindly following other people. Yeah. And then you find out it's the blind leading the blind, because just yeah. because someone says they're a political expert or a nutritional expert or an exercise expert, whatever it is, doesn't mean that they know everything and are the be all and end all. And so it is up to us in terms of our own personal power to look at what people are offering in their expert role, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To discern, okay, yeah, I can take this. You know what? That doesn't work for me. And so whether it's Benjamin Fulford or any of, of these other um, alternative news uh, portals, mm -hmm. we have to use our own discernment. Yes. And, you know, um, so you could say, oh, he put a link to this revelation thing about what was going on with the synagogues. Okay. People will read that report and think, that that's it, that that's all there is to know, that what was reported is the truth about what's happening there. And this is where you get stuck at the tip of the iceberg because we know with any and everything, what's at the tip of the iceberg is not the whole picture around what's on top of the surface and not even thinking about what's below the surface. And this is the the degree of discernment that we are being called to with this personal power activation. No longer the blind leading the blind, no longer the blind following the blind, no longer saying this person is an authority in this field. And so whatever they take, say, I'm going to take it first value. And that's the truth, the whole truth nothing but the truth. And so that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Yeah, exactly. You've got to use the alchemical process to discern what is the truth from what's being put out there and allow yourself the space for the other parts of the truth to be revealed to you. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and that's we only have the hum. Uh, well, we have our guides, but you know, it's the the humans that that feel they have resources that, and I'm sure they do, resources that tell them one thing or another about what's happening, and and then they trust their resources, 
or their sources, I should say, not resources, sources. Uh, and and then they, you know, go with that. And that's what they should do. That's their part of it. But yeah, without discernment, it's not going to, it's not going to fly. It's not the whole picture. No, it isn't. And the thing about Pluto moving into Aquarius is it's going to be pulling people into this understanding that they're they're seeing a small part of the picture. What's the bigger picture here? And this is in no way a disparaging comment on Benjamin Fulford. Bless his heart. He has been dedicated and committed to his role in getting out what he's inspired to get out. It's yeah. just that everybody needs to recognize. And I say this to people regarding my own work. This is what I'm receiving. Follow your own guidance. Yeah. This is what I'm receiving. This is what my key is unlocking. What is your key unlocking? Yeah. Well, yeah. Pieces of the puzzle, for sure. That's it. That's exactly it. When you're in a when you're in a hologram where everything is a fractal of the whole, how do you grasp the whole? You're only seeing fractals until you get to that place where you completely merge back into source and can see the whole. While we're here playing this game, you got to be aware you're only seeing parts of the whole. Exactly. Yeah. And Pluto moving through Aquarius is going to help humanity broaden their vision. That's good. To start to see more and more of the big picture, more and more of the parts that were being hidden, right? Because what does right. Pluto do? It brings what's been hidden into the light. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's what it does. <laughs> yeah, I really like Pluto. <laughs> I love Pluto. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Well, I appreciate you looking yes. into this whole Ganymede um, oh, sure. conversation that we had, you know, two and a half years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's fascinating to me that this is coming full circle again. And where is it going to lead from here? We know Pluto is a slow moving planet. So mm -hmm. the revelations will continue to unflow, uh, but it's like moving through tar, basically. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah. And we just have to have the patience to allow it to unfold in the divine timing. Right. Yeah. But what happened yesterday with that Sun Pluto conjunction crossing the threshold from 2959 Capricorn to zero. It is much more potent, much more significant. It's going to come to be much more meaningful in hindsight than I think right. most people have recognized. Right, right, exactly. Um, one of the things I was reading, and I, I mean, I can't. I'm not sure uh, who it was right now, but they went back to the last time. It was it was a astrologer, I think. He they went back to the last time this happened, you know, um, seventeen something, and uh, and and looked at what what went on in the world. Well, there was like the the signing of the declaration of independence, the uh, the rights of man in France was ratified and, and the French revolution. Revolution is a really big part of this. Uh, Pluto is a 
he inspires revolution, I think. And uh, while I don't want that to happen to us, uh, there can be different kinds of revolution. You know, the French stormed the Bastille and killed all the elite. Well, we're not going to do that. At least I hope we're not going to do that because that doesn't solve anything. But um, but it was interesting to look at, at what what happened during that time in the world. And um, and a lot of it had to do with free freedom. What what really what do we perceive freedom to be? And uh, so I'm really excited about that part. Yeah. Well, and just taking what you spoke to, mm -hmm. two key words, revolution, freedom. Right. These are key words for Aquarius and Uranus who rules Aquarius. Okay. Yes. And so how is the way that we are going to reclaim, right? Because Pluto enables us to reclaim our power, reclaim the power of our freedom as a humanity, uh, going to be revolutionized over the way that humanity attempted to do it in the past, which clearly yeah. didn't work. Yeah. Right? There is some new leading edge, liberating way for humanity to reclaim the power of our freedom as a global community, as a Christed race that's not condemned by sin. Right. That is going to unfold over these next two decades. Yes. And exactly. so we, we can look back to what was going on when Pluto made its ingress from Capricorn to Aquarius. And yes, the whole American well, yeah. Revolution was a part of that. Well, it was it was the signing of the Constitution. I'm sorry, the Declaration was prior to that. That was the start of the revolution. Right. So right. yeah. But right. um, so it was the signing of the Constitution that happened during that time and the rights of man in um, France. We're, we're kind of hooked up with France pretty strongly for some reason. The United States is, um, I always thought it was England, but everything I study keeps going back to France for some reason. Um, but, it, uh, well, they were an ally <laughs> during the revolution. So maybe that's why. Um, well, so we want, what we want to see is what are the innovative ways that are going to come forward now mm -hmm. over yes. the next two decades in terms of how humanity yeah. is going to reclaim the power of freedom for itself? Yeah. Uh, that will look very differently. Yeah. Maybe people will start taking Russell more seriously. I don't know. He seems to be dropping off the planet as far as what's happening. I don't know, but, um, you know, we'll see it's what we'll, people we'll, believe we'll that see. counts. Yeah. Right. And remember Aquarius is the highest frequency of the air signs. It's all right. about consciousness. Right. So the beliefs that people have, which are more related with the Gemini frequencies, right, um, are going to be coming into this new area of balance as we come into conscious equal partnership on this Aries Libra axis where we're having these eclipses over the next two years as Pluto is going into Aquarius. And then when we get to this balance point and are able to be in conscious equal partnership, then all of these innovative ideals can start to come forth. As long as we're stuck down here in belief systems that are running us, controlling us, manipulating us, the innovative tools that can liberate us aren't going to have a chance because it's a frequency thing. Exactly. We've got to come into conscious equal partnership, right? Moving from Gemini into Libra, 
on that Aries Libra axis, once we're in the conscious equal partnership, whoosh, now Aquarian energies, all these innovative ideals of how we can just really move ourselves forward are going to yeah. be able to show up. Okay, well, I'll let you go. I know you've got a lot to do today. And Okay. <laughs> I appreciate so, you having this conversation with me. Well, I uh, do too. Thank you. I, I, I'm going to send you the link of that that class that we did. Okay. Because it, when you listen back to how enlightening that conversation was okay. <laughs> that time, <laughs> it'll blow your mind. Okay, thank you. That'll be great. <laughs> Thanks so much. I appreciate it, Maureen. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.